thanks all for dallying in here on this important policy and uh, committee meeting here of the chamber. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Nikki Freed. Uh, I met Nikki years ago uh, during my service in the Florida Senate. When I met Mickey, Nikki, uh, she was working for a law firm and lobbying in Tallahassee. She was an associate of a good friend of mine and her fellow lobbyist, Fred Karlinski. Her clients during that time ranged from the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority to the Walt Disney Company to Duke Energy. And in, 19, and in 2016, she established her own lobbying firm. Her contributions during those years earned her the respect of the Florida legislature. Nikki grew up in Miami. She attended the University of Florida. And as student body president of the university, she knew that she was destined for a successful political career in our state. One of her political com competitors at the university described her to me as a political beast. Now, contrary to the sound of that statement, he used that term as a sincere compliment to Nikki's tenacity and to her energy. She formed the Ignite Party. That name should give you a secret about her tenacity right there and how she was set, gonna set the university on fire. She formed that Ignite Party, she defeated her opponents and she became the university's student body president. She's a graduate of the university's law school and she's a member of the Florida Blue Key. She also earned a master's degree in political campaigning from the university. In 2018, Nikki ran to become the 12th Florida Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services. She's the first Democrat to hold that office since 2001, and she's currently the only Democrat elected to a statewide office in the state of Florida. She ran on a platform of, uh, in favor of removing obstacles to medical marijuana in Florida and pri prioritizing our waterways with a reliance on science over politics. <laughs> Rumors abound about her political future in our state of Florida. I would guess she has ambitions to continue to grow politically and to continue to serve our state. Nikki, thanks very much for joining us today. Welcome to our Zoom call and thank you for being part of our program. Oh, thank you, Garrett, for such a warm introduction. I wonder who you spoke to uh, uh, back from my UF days, uh, but certainly it's so great to see you and I see Michael on there as well. Um, you all have been uh, close allies and friends for a very long time and it was always great to see what your next steps were after you left the Senate and, and really truly were a trailblazer in the chamber and so um, appreciate our friendship for, for a while. Um, and good afternoon to the Naples Chamber. Um, you know, every single day we at the Department of Agriculture um, impact people's lives um, from our Floridians to our businesses to our, our economy. Uh, FDAX is a $1.7 billion agency, which is $147 billion agricultural impacts across our entire state uh, with 2 million of our jobs. And one of the other things that we oversee that most people don't know about is our food and nutrition program. Uh, we have about right now in our state, unfortunately, 3.5 million Floridians that are food insecure. And that has increased almost by a, a close to almost a million people uh, since COVID. And 1 million of those, unfortunately, are our children. Every single year, we feed about 319 million school meals to so many of our children that are either free or reduced. Uh, the other parts of our agency, we oversee and regulate 40,000 uh, different stores and markets that are in food safety. Uh, we also regulate 500,000 different types of businesses and products and devices uh, and handle over 400,000 consumer complaints complaints and increase every single year. Uh, we regulate businesses, everything from auto repair shops and palm brokers and gyms and health studios um, to interstate uh, travel movers, sellers of travel, uh, as well as our infamous telemarketers. It's something that we spend a lot of time trying to combat. 
Um, during FDAX, uh, during the COVID, FDAX uh, had a lot of our employees that we worked remotely, um, except for the ones that unfortunately had to be out in the field to continuing to do their job and making sure that there were safety measures both out in the field and that everybody was following protocols. Uh, but we were there to protect our employees here at the department. Uh, we also spent a, a significant amount of time during COVID uh, working on bilingual farm worker safety education campaigns as well um, as we are going through COVID and the aftermath. Uh, one of the other things that was a, a huge priority um, for me was coming into my office uh, was the expansion of cannabis here in the state, uh, not only protecting and expanding medical marijuana patients, uh, but also creating uh, the hemp industry here in our state. Uh, the future of hemp and cannabis industry is bright here in the state of Florida. Um, I have estimated the hemp industry to be a 25 to $30 billion industry within the next five to 10 years. Uh, the can cannabis equals green industrial revolution. Uh, that is going to create jobs, uh, both on the economic growth, uh, 25,000 known usages of the hemp plant. A lot of people think that hemp is just another marijuana product used for creation of CBD and other types of inhalation. Um, but quite honestly, my excitement about hemp is not so much on the CBD side, uh, but more the industrial side. Uh, this is going to replace all of our plastics and styrofoam, uh, use it as biofuel, health issues, construction, textiles, um, really it, the, the endless of the opportunities um, that we are going to have here for the state of Florida for hemp. Uh, currently this year, we have 800 cultivation permits that we have given out. Um, we first launched our hemp program back in April 27th of 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic, and already have 800 permits. Uh, we have 1,000 already approved cultivation sites and locations across the state, uh, 22 licensed acres, uh, an estimated already $370 million economic impact. So already in just this first year, huge success in the industry. And things that are even on the marijuana side that I've been working on is really trying to create some science-based improvements and modernizations in the marijuana program, not just here in the state, uh, but across the country. Uh, just a briefly on some of my legislative priorities this year, um, as I mentioned, food insecurity, uh, unfortunately, during this pandemic has not only escalated, but really showed um, the rest of our state and our country uh, what is happening in our food supply and how many people are in need. Uh, so we have a pretty comprehensive food insecurity bill that was going to address a lot of things from calling for universal breakfast for our children uh, to finding ways to get our, our farmers to submit more of their food to whether it's food banks or local pantries. Uh, it's a pretty, a pretty extensive um, bill. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't moving in the legislature, but uh, we will keep fighting and we will keep doing whatever we need to inside of the department. Uh, another big legislative priority is energy and climate. As Garrett said, um, one of my main priority platform issues during 2018 was water uh, and making sure that we have a clean water supply, uh, not just um, for, for my agricultural industry, but for, for humans uh, and making sure that we have drinkable water and you know, people come to our state, especially you know, this, you know, from Naples, that if we don't have beautiful beaches and uh, infrastructure, people aren't gonna come to our, our state. Uh, so this has to be a priority. So we did an extensive uh, energy and climate bill as well uh, that goes everywhere from uh, far, you know, planting trees and giving resources to our local governments, um, to energy efficiency in low economic communities, uh, to carbon sequestration and carbon farming, uh, which is another product that is another agricultural com commodity that a lot of our farmers can figure out new tools uh, to keep this, the carbon inside of the soil and, and it becomes a commodity for them. And another issue that we are, are tackling since getting into office is our concealed weapons program. Uh, as the regulator of our concealed weapons, uh, unfortunately, uh, my predecessor had allowed uh, background checks to not be uh, done for about 13 months and 292 individuals fell through the cracks and received uh, their concealed weapons permit uh, that they shouldn't have. Uh, we got in, we cleaned house, and not only do we make sure that every single individual receives a complete and accurate background check, uh, but we also have uh, reduced the time. Uh, by almost 98% for wait time for concealed. Now we're back up a little bit uh, just because of the pandemic, all of our offices were closed and people weren't able to obtain fingerprints. Uh, and so those numbers are up and always up around elections and during the pandemic in general. We had about 200% increase in the amount of applications uh, over the last year. Uh, so we are working hard. Uh, I get every single day updates 
um, for my department uh, of where we are and the reducing of the wait times. But in this process, we also found a pretty large and substantial loophole in the program. Uh, that since we can't retain fingerprints, that if an individual is um, outside of the state of Florida and gets arrested, we won't be notified. And, and potentially that arrest could be a disqualifier or at least a suspension of their license. So we are working on those loopholes and trying to fix them. Uh, another important priority of mine was also broadband, uh, that we have too many people in our state that don't have access to the internet. And COVID unfortunately escalated that situation with everybody teleworking, uh, children being virtually learning, uh, telehealth. And, and so we've got to make sure, and we call it the last mile, that we know that there's infrastructure in place, but to get the last mile uh, into so many of our homes has really been a priority of mine. Uh, I've been working with the USDA and a lot of DC. Uh, so we are doing things on a constant basis to improve the lives of people across the state uh, to support local businesses. I actually just came back from uh, a round table down here in uh, Broward County uh, with some dynamic, dynamic uh, Latina owned small businesses and uh, just hearing some of the obstacles that, that they have had to overcome. Um, some immigrated from their countries uh, and just so hearing from those perspectives of how I can help support them types of small businesses who need um, the resources and, and the tools to be able to be competitive uh, with a lot of their male counterparts. Uh, so it is something that I'm just so passionate about is supporting our local communities, our local businesses, and making sure that we have an environment uh, that uh, in entrepreneurship uh, at all different levels. Um, so again, I am so honored here with you today. I will certainly try Commissioner, I think we lost you for a second there, but I do know that we have some questions and, and Julie, our chairwoman, has joined the call as well. And so if, if you're ready, we, we're going to start fire, have Julie uh, start firing them over to you. Sure. Great. Great. Commissioner Freed, thank you so much. My apologies that I missed your introduction by Garrett, but uh, he was well equipped to welcome you to, to this group. And, and it's really valuable to have you with us here today. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks for that overview. So just as a reminder to everybody, please um, send your questions within chat uh, to me and then I'll read them off to the commissioner. So let's see, I'm gonna start with, ah, oh, I like this one. Um, so how do you see, Commissioner Freed, how do you see the population increase in Florida? You know, it seemed to have accelerated in COVID, right? Everyone wanted to come here. Um, but how do you see the population increase and the demographics impacting Florida's future? Loaded question, but a good one. Loaded question. Um, yes, even before the pandemic, uh, we were hearing statistics of a thousand people per day moving to our state. And so I talk a lot about that as far as even, you know, when it comes to agriculture. Um, one is that we have all this amazing natural reserves and and conservation movements here in our state and agriculture, again, there's 47,000 working farms and ranches. And so as more and more people are moving into our state, what happens to that land? You know, because we need to build out for, for infrastructure and build out for, for the population growth. And so there is a huge concern that the pr property values are continuing to increase. And it's really hard for our farmers to compete, um, to keep, you know, making, you know, just really neat um, when they have, you know, developers knocking on their door, offering them, you know, fifteen hundred, you know, dollars per acre, where they may be only receiving, um, you know, pennies on the dollar for the food that they're actually producing. Um, so this is something that we need to be focusing on. And as we know that we do have, you know, climate crisis that is happening and sea level rising on our, our coastal areas, and as more and more people are having to move inland, you know, we don't have a lot of beach property anymore. Um, and so we need to be really, as a state focusing on how we're going to do growth uh, and making sure that we don't do it in a way that takes away the beauty of our state, whether that's our natural springs, whether that's our conservation areas. Um, did I lose you all? No. I can oh, still hear you. All right. Okay, I just make sure you can still hear me. <laughs> 
Uh, and, and so that's something that we have to collectively work on uh, to make sure that, you know, we are creating infrastructure on uh, whether it is sewer septic, uh, making sure that we are creating an environment um, where we are still protecting our environment at the same time. Uh, but this is something that is a great concern. Uh, we may need to start building up and not out and doing finding ways to really work with our, our local governments um, on their development plans. Excellent. Oh, love it. And I think uh, this is from Brian Galligan, and I, I believe he's with the Naples Botanical Garden, which is amazing if you have not visited here in Naples. But uh, so here's the statement, then a question. So the Naples Botanical Garden has had a strong focus on cleaning water with plants, along with planting education for professionals. This is potentially done by offering educational opportunities to the hands um, for professionals in best management practices. The landscape industry is a booming sector of our area, certainly with the, the growth. How do you plan to improve awareness and opportunities of the landscape and nursery trade? Yeah, and thank you, Brian, for, for what you are doing and for, for that question. Uh, and you're right, our, our landscaping industry here in the state is one of the largest in the country. Uh, and so I'm on constant communication with the association, gone to a, a lot of the trade shows, uh, not unfortunately during 2020, but prior to that. And so it's creating awareness. I think that most people think of agriculture in our state and they think of oranges and they think of you know, different types of specialty crops and don't realize the impact of our, of our nursery. Uh, I was actually down in Homestead yesterday um, talking to some of our other nursery growers down there and seeing the boom that it's been happening with more and more people being at home, uh, more individuals wanting to do home improvements. And so it is an education to so what we have here available and, and making sure that, that the state understands that when you plant more trees and you plant more, you know, uh, you know different types of nursery aspects, that is a better for the environment, um, helping with um, cleaning of our waters and, and cleaning of our air. Uh, so that's certainly something that we spend a lot of time on putting out uh, how to videos, uh, promoting the industry, uh, and, and really, you know, having conversations like this on a consistent basis with uh, more of our business community uh, to understand the impact of agriculture. Great. Thank you. That'll continue to be a theme, whether that's on a local basis, um, you know, the landscape management and, and certainly as it relates to water and, and the fertilizers and chemicals that, that infiltrate. So that seems to be somewhat disparate across localities as opposed to a statewide initiative. So it'll be interesting to see how that transforms. Here's uh, a question around the citrus industry. So based on the trends, you know, it's obviously we're the citrus state uh, for not from concentrate and for concentrate orange juice. It is really the only state in the United States that produces such. What's your view on our ability, the citrus uh, industry's ability to recover um, in the pre-greening and hurricane, you know, from the hurricane Irma uh, impact and then is the current production the new normal based on circumstances and market demand? What's your, what's your view overall on the supply demand, pest and pestilence around the impacts in the citrus industry? You know, citrus industry, and thank you, Michael, uh, for that question, and definitely good to see you. Uh, the citrus industry has really been hit pretty hard um, in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, one from citrus screening, uh, which has decimated our, our industry, but also from weather conditions from the hurricanes uh, over the years. Uh, and our citrus growers, um, I have, I feel like met all of them in our state, are some of the most resilient fighters that I have ever met. Uh, they are willing to try everything and anything to get the citrus um, under control. Uh, in fact, I moved, I, I spent uh, my first trade mission in Israel um, in May of 2019. And we spent a lot of time and with companies over in Israel talking about citrus greening and ways to combat it. As of today, there is no known um, cures. Uh, so we've spent a lot of money, both from Florida as well as the USDA, uh, working on different tools um, and ways to do early detections, how to reduce the impact of greening. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our growers um, 
back in the, that haven't been able to survive. Uh, so a lot have sold their acreage and have gone to other types of, whether it's development or other types of, of farming activities. Uh, and so we are hopeful that we continue to push resources in their direction uh, and, and get through it. We have seen a decline, obviously, in the production of citrus, partly because of greening, um, but also partly because we've seen a, a lot of the industry uh, move away from citrus. Um, the demand is still high. Um, when I've been talking to Citrus Mutual all throughout COVID, trying to figure out, you know, their impact from COVID, uh, their demand was high. You know, everybody was drinking fresh from Florida orange juice during COVID to increase their immune system. And so the demand is still going to be there. Uh, and, you know, we just need to give the resources and continue supporting our citrus industry. We have a little under 300,000 acreages that it is growing in citrus. Uh, it used to be a significantly more in, in our state. Uh, this still is a staple commodity. Uh, it's on our license plates. We, we can't give up. Uh, we need to continue fighting for citrus and uh, they have the full faith and support of my office. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's truly very important. Um, Oh, I love this question. Uh, this for you, uh, Commissioner Freed. What so far do you feel is your department's greatest success and what has been your greatest frustration? That's one part of a question. And then the second one, and there was a second question on this around broadband access. Clearly you've hit on something that, that was very vulnerable and shown, shown to us vulnerable in 2020. So two parts, you know, greatest success, greatest frustration over the course of, uh, of your tenure. And then let's talk a little bit about the broadband initiative. Yep, uh, greatest success is how, um, it, it's it, we, it, and as our only statewide elected Democrat, I was able to work with my Republican colleagues in the House and the Senate. Uh, they sponsored the legislation and we got it passed. Uh, I think there was one no vote. Uh, between all three committees on both sides and on the floor and uh, both chambers. Uh, and now has given our farmers an alternative crop. You heard the statistics that I already talked about. This is going to be a, a green revolution for our state. Uh, and I do believe that we are between all of our ports and uh, ability to export uh, not only throughout the country, but overseas. Uh, this is gonna be pivotal to the future of our economy. My greatest frustration, as I said, I'm the only statewide elected Democrat. <laughs> um, and so my greatest frustration has been, you know, quite honestly, I walked in in 2018 after being elected and all four members of our cabinet, um, all of us are under 50. All of us have young families and really thought that there was going to be an opportunity for us to work together uh, to show the rest of the country how bipartisan works in Florida and that we were going to rise above partisan politics and, and do good for our state. Um, I, I've been frustrated that that has not been what's happened. Um, and I will continue to, to work on that. I, I always will believe state before party and will continue to, to keep my door open uh, and, and hope that at some point um, the governor and I can work together on some really important issues for the state. And when it comes to broadband, uh, yes, uh, this has been a complication. And I want to tell you where it started. Um, it started in 2019. Um, I wasn't aware how bad it was, um, but I also knew that our farmers were, when it comes to suicide rates, were one of the worst in the country, when farmers in general. And so I wanted to figure out a way to get to our farmers and, and think about ways to create an app for maybe mental telehealth and, and give them those resources. And as we were developing the app, um, it, we started thinking through, well, if they don't have access to the internet, how are they going to utilize this app? And so we started to dive into it and, and see what can be done. Um, there are grant dollars that come from the federal government through the USDA, but we can't apply for it. It's got to be a, a, a partnership and an, an actual um, corporation that has to sign on that they're going to develop it. And there just wasn't an appetite um, from any of our providers across the state. And so we need to kind of think outside the box, different types of incentives, different types of money. Uh, and it really is gonna take all of us between state, local, federal, and our public private partnerships to really work together. Uh, this is the last of the you know, resources. I mean, they, they need them for just general 
information and, you know, getting in contact with society and for, for work and for productivity. Uh, so this is something that there's some legislation that is being worked on through our right now. Um, we are in support of it and hopefully we can get it across the finish line and get some additional resources here in the state that can be matched from the federal government. Just a follow on conversation uh, for that. What, what kind of number budget number would we be looking at to to ensure that connectivity that you know as fundamental as an app we all have it on our phones but it's being connected what what does that look like you know we've we've seen everything from you know 25 million to less uh i mean this is in the grand in the grand scheme of things you know we talk about infrastructure this is this is fundamental this is basics uh and so that that kind of number has been floated around um, I, I'm sure that we can go up and we can go down and, and it's just a matter of having everybody committed um, to making this making this change and getting them the infrastructure that they need in these communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, USDA has has provided a, a, a great funding, you know, within the rural area. I do a lot of work in the rural area with with clients and I know they there is money to be had. That's for certain. So, oh my gosh, you guys, there's so many great questions and I, I want to apologize if I miss anyone. So this just tells you how interested people are in what you do and, you know, your span of influence, um, you know, and within your organization. So a lot of different questions here. Let me find one here. Actually, is a follow on to the broadband. And this comes from Jennifer Trammell, Jen Trammell. Uh, she has great, insightful questions. And she's, she's asking, you know, as a community, we're very connected. And what can we do as both individuals um, and as a committee of government relations and public policy to best support some of the initiatives you identified, including the broadband access. You know, what could we do to, to help you and uh, move this forward? It is important. I think we all recognize it. Yeah, I, I think as far as broadband is concerned, um, if there are members uh, of the chamber that are in whether it's AT&T or other types of you know, service providers, um, finding that maybe local money um, to kind of put together a plan of how to get, you know, figure out, first of all, how much part of the community is actually impacted. You know, and I think that that's part of it too, is figuring out how many, how many individuals are there. Um, and then coming up with a game plan of whether it's, again, money from the local government, whether it's sponsorships from, from other corporations, um, whether it's the service providers, and coming up with a local game plan. And, and then seeing where there might be, whether funding matches or state matches, um, and coming up with a game plan. The other thing that, again, that I talk a lot about that has something to do with broadband, but another part of, of our state, is the food insecurity aspect. And this is something that is so important that our business leaders understand that it is impacting your all's bottom lines too. That with over, you know, 3 million, 3.5 million Floridians that are food insecure, um, you've got to know that some of those are in our in our businesses and it's our neighbors. And it impacts because again, if you are food insecure and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, it's likely to be completely focused work issue is that you probably are also have a nutritional issues and are spending more time in whether your diabetes or obesity and other concerns that you have a medical you know issue uh, so it's something that needs to be focused on and there's a lot of communities that are doing things outside um, the box on creating new new ways to tackle food deserts and tackle food insecurity uh, but it's something that, that I think keep it Oh, Jenna, I think we may have lost her. Yeah, I think we may have lost the commissioner. We lost her. <laughs> I got back on. Are you okay? Can you hear me? We can, can hear, hear you. you. Great. We lost the tail end of that, though. But I think we got the gist of it. I was saying food insecurity, that it that needs to be a priority of all of our communities working together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just a follow on question is that have we, um, I haven't kept up with this, but in, in talking to you agribusiness, you know, there's always been a little bit of a, a liability, you know, leave the crop out on the field. Um, 
to, you know, just spoil or actually donate it into food banks, but there seemed to have been a, a barrier around liability, some liability protection. Is that an issue today or has that been cleared out? The liability issues no, with I think I mean that's still always a concern. Um, especially, it, and not so much the liability of like once the food leaves the, the property, it's more if you have organizations, I've been trying uh, our schools to use um, volunteer work on our farms as another tool for our kids to one, learn about agriculture, but two, get community service hours. Right. And there is that liability aspect of people coming onto the farms to volunteer and to work. Um, the biggest problem that I saw with the donation of food, uh, especially during COVID, we saw $500 million for the loss of our food. And it wasn't because they didn't want to donate it. Um, a lot of our farmers did donate a significant amount of food last year. The problem was a lot of the food banks um, were not able to keep the fresh produce. That they they don't they have you know warehouses and there's not as much refrigerated storage. And so a lot of that food would have gone bad, uh, even though you know we know that people needed it. And then of course, unfortunately, it's a business decision that if they know that they can't sell the food, how much of their own resources can they afford? Um, to keep getting, to keep harvesting the food if there's not a place to sell it to. Yeah. Yeah. The farmers, the farmers to families program, you know, last year, which I think has, has sunset, has it? Yes. And so there are different programs that are going to be stood up this year um, under USDA and some of the American um, Recovery Act. Um, and so I know that there's more programs that are in the works, but that program has come and gone. Yes. But it, it, it seemed to have been effective. So um, water, you know, we all, we're all surrounded by it. It is one of our top priorities um, as an organization and as a committee. So concerns around water are front and center for us. So in light of the legislation that's dividing up the Sadowski Fund um, to provide funding to sea level rise and stormwater mitigation projects, what would you like to see that funding spent on to improve Florida water quality? Yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, first, I would never want the, uh, you know, as our, our past appropriations chair over here, um, you know, to have that fund rated. Uh, but infrastructure is, is, is essential. It is really spending a lot of time figuring out ways, not only for sea level rising, um, but also the other infrastructures happening in our state. How, how do we move forward on the climate crisis, moving towards more renewables, uh, making sure that we are providing resources to communities um, that become more energy efficient. So a lot of that money should go into even, you know, finding ways for electric vehicles. My office over, you know, helps coordinate too is electric vehicles and the infrastructure that's necessary as more and more people are moving in that direction. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the money I would like to see goes into, you know, we all hear about sea level rise and then we got to fix that and we got to talk about ways, you know, to, to build up the, the structure on, on the side of the coastlines, but we also have to recognize that there's more going on than just sea level rising and, and that we've got to spend time focusing on some of those other environmental impacts, um, including what we saw, you know, not too far from you, which is Piney Point and, and some of the, the stacks that are across our state that are really making time bombs on our environment and how are we going to move forward um, to protect our environment and, and spend the additional resources because if we don't do it now, the impact that we're going to have to fix in the next five to 10 years is going to quadruple the amount that we would need to spend now um, versus, you know, in the future. And it creates, again, more job opportunities in our state if we're putting the money into infrastructure projects and moving our state forward on ways to clean our waterways, uh, whether that, that's, you know, subject to sewer, um, whether that is irrigation systems giving us more funding to do, uh, which I've been asking for from the legislature, more uh, water projects to figure out ways to clean our waterway, how to preserve the act um, all of the, our, our drinking water. Uh, there's some great new technology out there. Uh, we just need to put the resources in place uh, to move it forward here in the state. Excellent. Well, I, I will tell you, there are numerous questions and that remain, but I think we have to wrap up because you have a very busy day ahead of you. What I'd like to suggest or request is that we have you back because there are a lot of questions um, that we didn't get to and uh, we'd love to hear more from you.
uh, these are, I think are critical things for uh, not only for the state, but uh, there's a high interest here out, out of Collier County. So we'd love to have you back. And just to- well, That was a promise. Um, <laughs> we'll definitely do so. And to everyone who had questions, we're gonna send them over to Alan, uh, who's here on the line in Commissioner Freed's office, and he'll get as many of them answered as he can for you guys. Great. Thank you, Jenna. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any final comments? Commissioner, thank you so much. Yeah. For this was really <laughs> informative. Thank you. I wish that we had more time to answer those questions, but thank you for your commitment to your community uh, and having me on here today and, and certainly would love to come back uh, and continue a lot of these conversations. Great. Thank you so much. Stay well. Thank you. Take care. You too. Well, thanks everybody for being on. We really appreciate having you. Um, if many of you are members of our of our public policy government relations committee and uh, you know the work that we're trying to do and accomplish uh, we we always try to make sure that we're bringing in people to be the voice of uh, of our economy and to better understand the policy issues around our our community and our state we'll we continue these efforts uh, we don't have another uh, public policy committee meeting i don't think until like the june time frame in there but uh, we've got uh, uh, some other events coming up we got pints and politics coming up on may 11th um, which is going to be a, out at the sports park. Be a great opportunity to hear from our uh, some of our local elected officials. We've got uh, Bob Rommel, Andy Solis, Rick LaCastro, Bill McDaniel, Terry Hutchison, Ted Blankenship. So far, those have all committed to uh, joining us. I'm sure there may be some others as we get closer. So again, that's uh, May 11th. It'll be in the uh, in the late afternoon there at the sports park. So again, uh, put, put that on your calendar. Chamber, our, uh, our annual meeting is going to be a big reception. It'll be uh, May 21st. We'll do it at the, uh, uh, at the Ritz Beach Resort. And uh, you, you see information on our website about all of the chamber events, but we'd love to have you to, to attend these and be a part of it there. Um, you know, I, there were a lot of questions, and Julie did a great job of trying to do the best she could to try to handle as many of those questions. It's, it's a testament to... Uh, the, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services oversees a lot of stuff. Yes. And, uh, and so a lot of different areas in our economy and a lot of people aren't frequently aware that that's what that, uh, that agency does, department does for, uh, for us in a state. So please, uh, whenever you have any questions dealing with government affairs, government issues, please don't ever hesitate to ask us. And, you know, we've got, a, we've got a team here that can track down answers. We've got people who, can, who know and are familiar with working with the different agencies. And I always wanna encourage our business members to 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 please you know ask us those questions and let us let us help you out with the issues that you may be having or the information you're trying to figure out so again jenna let's see thanks everybody thanks garrett great job on the introduction we appreciate that um thanks to all of you for taking the time and being part of this today anything else jenna no i think that's it michael summed it up all nicely thank you again to the commissioner thank you to alan brock with the commissioner's office who oversees uh southwest florida and uh, thanks to Julie and Garrett for all you guys have done. Thanks to you guys. Absolutely. Thank Take you. care, everybody. This was great. great. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.